Hello everyone, bringing you a video today which was prompted by conversations with people at the Victory Show this year. And this is looking at, well it's the first in a series of videos looking at the kit and equipment of British troops serving in the Far East circa 1944-45, so the latter part of the war after the introduction of the Indian jungle green clothing, the Indian made jungle green battle dress and bush jacket and so forth. We're going to be talking about this in the context of reenactment, so those wanting to recreate this kit and equipment. It's not difficult in terms of the kit that was used, so it's not difficult to identify the items which were used out there. It is difficult in as much as not much of this stuff is reproduced. And most of the kit, in fact, I think all the kit I wear is basically original and is worn sparingly. So it's difficult from that point of view. There's nothing that's an ideal reproduction of any of these items on the market. So any attempts to recreate the kit and equipment involves modification and so forth. So we're going to talk about that a little bit as we obviously look at these items in some detail. We'll start with the headgear I have on the mannequin here, which is the, the slouch hat or bush hat you can see here. These were made from rabbit fur felt and they're very hard wearing and they were issued to most frontline troops serving in the Far East. The Mark II helmet was also commonly worn by British infantry as well, but this is probably the most versatile headgear. It was used by the Chinidits. Uh, it was their exclusive headgear, basically. They didn't wear anything else. You, you have them all wearing the, uh, the uh, slouch hats we have here. And then the Mark II steel helmet was seen widely amongst regular infantry and so forth as well. But this is probably the most versatile headgear. Now this is an original, a very battered example. This is how they would initially be issued with a white band around, as you can see here, just a white worsted tape band around there. Obviously the press stud to allow the brim to be buttoned up on the left hand side, as you can see there. Often worn down, however, in the field. Puggeries were generally added at unit level so you don't necessarily need a puggery. It's very common to see in the field the hats worn just with the white band here. Now an alternative for this would perhaps be a civilian hat like this one here. Now this is a uh, civilian item which is not dissimilar. It has the, the eyelets there, the press stud here on the side as you can see. You could perhaps pick one of these up second hand. I found this one on eBay. It was purchased with the intention of putting together South African war, a uh, Boer War kit and uh, it will be used for that at some point in the future when time and funds permit. Obviously, I'm currently investing heavily in getting the loft sorted out as a suitable storage space for the collection. So various projects like this have gone on the back burner. But this is a civilian hat, and we'll have a look inside now at the labels so you can see who made this. You can see there inside the crown of the hat, we have a sticker, Prina. And then if you look around the side, you can see the international hat around the sweatband there. So as I say, this is just a civilian hat I picked up on eBay. It, nevertheless, in terms of dimensions and the design is basically identical to a wartime British issue slouch hat. So would be suitable for use in a reenacting context. And that's, I intend to use it for, as a Boer War era slouch hat. That's the intention anyway. So there's possibilities there of finding these in civilian items, that is to say, uh, which could fill in for an issue item, an original item, which I have here. These were produ reproduced for a time uh, by, I think, Spearhead, and they weren't actually that bad. They weren't terrible. I think the felt they were made from may have included plastic as well, but visually they weren't terrible. And that would be another option, potentially, if you could find one of those. I don't know if they're still manufactured anymore. If anyone has other sources for these, uh, which are, are decent enough for use for reenacting, feel free to comment down below. But that's one option for headgear, is you could find a, a civilian replacement, which is nevertheless close in terms of dimensions and obviously the design with the, the eyelets there. Now obviously original slouch hats do vary in terms of the number of eyelets and so forth as well. So that's something to consider. Uh, and originals can be picked up. They're quite pricey. You probably want to, wouldn't want to wear them that much. This is a particularly battered example. The lining and everything has been removed. So it's my wearing hat basically. I do have nicer examples as well. But yes, civilian option there to replace the issue slouch hat or, or original slouch hat rather. Moving on now to talk about what we have on the mannequin here, the shirt. Now this is an Angola shirt, uh, which is a wool cotton mix flannel. It's very comfortable, they were very popular. And the reason I'm showing this is, this is probably the most versatile bit of clothing you could get in terms of shirts, jackets, etc. They're very popular, they were widely used. Photographs show them in units mixed with other clothing. So there would be, there's no reason why you wouldn't have some men wearing one of these and some men perhaps wearing the cellular bush jacket. This is an original example. It has been modified with the addition of a collar. So originally these just have a cotton tape collar like the British issue wool shirts at the time. So you don't have this falling collar at all. That's been added on by shortening the skirts and using the cloth to make this collar here. So 
in terms of finding one of these, they're rather difficult to find originals and they're not obviously, they don't tend to turn up in huge sizes. You could potentially, much as the material wouldn't be exactly correct, you could potentially get a couple of reproduction British shirts and then have them retailored with the pockets, the scallop pocket shape here, you can see that there, and then also epaulettes on the shoulders. That's the main differentiation between the two. Obviously, it is a half-fronted shirt, as you can see here. You'd also need to swap the buttons for something similar to, to this, which is horn, or perhaps coconut shell could be used as well. If I move this around here, we'll be able to have a look at the detail of the epaulette as well. You can see the epaulette here and how that attaches into the shoulder seam there. And it comes up to, you can see the sort of shape, the epaulette there, and that comes up to another of these little horn buttons up on the shoulder there, as you can see. And if we look at the back here, you can see there is a yoke across the shoulders there. So in terms of construction, that's the details of construction of this. As I say, the collar is added on. Originally, you would have had a, a three quarter inch, roughly three quarter inch high cotton drill collar around there, much as you have on the standard issue British khaki flannel shirt of the time. So as I say, no one reproduces these, unfortunately, which is a shame. They would be the most versatile piece of clothing to have reproduced for troops in the Far East. You could, as I say, much as the material wouldn't be correct, you could get a reproduction British shirt or perhaps find someone to make you one custom. I imagine finding Angola, which is to say the cotton wool mix would be a problem, but the wool flannel would not be too different from this visually, provided you could get something in a, in a similar color. Colors do vary quite widely as well. So that's one a good thing about Indian manufactured items of clothing is that there are variations. And so there is a, a sort of spectrum you can get away with as it were. Uh, in terms of the colour. This is a particularly green, dark green example, uh, I would say. Uh, you do see them in lighter tones as well. So that's a possible option there. There are other options for uh, jackets and shirts and so forth, which we're going to talk about in part two, which are primarily the, well, it's basically the Indian cellular uh, battle dress blouse and the Indian cellular bush jacket, which we'll talk about in the next part of this series. But that's the shirt there, which as I say, is the most versatile bit of clothing you can get. In terms of trousers for troops in the field, there's basically one option, and that is the Indian jungle green battle dress trousers, drill battle dress trousers. So these are part of the uniform which includes the cellular battle dress blouse, which is the Indian tropical battle dress that was introduced during the war, introduced in 1943 in jungle green, as we have here. So you have a mat pocket down on the leg here with a single pleat, as you can see. And then you have the dressing pocket round on the other leg here, as you would typical battle dress fashion, essentially, that's what makes these battle dress trousers. And then at the waist here, you can see the fastening involves two pronged buckles, which button in place. And these all use Indian die stamped metal buttons, which are quite a distinctive shape. Again, unfortunately, no one who reproduces these reproduces the right buttons, but that's a detail. So you have two single prong buckles there and two corresponding straps. And that's how the waist fastens, which gives you quite a bit of adjustment. And then you have little loops here, which obviously the, the ends of the tails of those straps pass through. So in terms of reproductions of these, two companies do reproduce something close. Soldier Fortune reproduced something very close to these. The colour is not bad at all. The stitching isn't quite right. The stitching should be a paler colour than the rest of the trousers. But the major failing with them is the fact they don't use a pronged buckle at the waist. They do have the two straps, but they have plain buckles and no holes in the straps. So that's something that would need to be modified for, from an accuracy point of view. Otherwise, they're pretty good. And after being washed for a while, perhaps left on the line for a few days or a few weeks to fade in the sun and so forth over the summer, they would look quite effective. They would need that modification. Another option is What Price Glory, who reproduced these but in khaki drill. And they were made in khaki drill as well. But What Price Glory only reproduced these in khaki drill. The jungle green trousers, and if you're ordering from What Price Glory, it's very important to remember this, the jungle green trousers, which What Price Glory sells as British World War II jungle trousers, are not World War II jungle trousers. They're part of the late war British jungle kit, and they're the drill version of the trousers, if anything, from that set. So they're made to that pattern, that is to say, the uniform and so, so forth associated with the 1944 pattern web equipment, all part of that late war jungle kit, which didn't see service during the war. So the pattern of trousers he's used to make the jungle green trousers he sells are from that late war jungle kit. And they were produced in drill for second line troops, but they aren't accurate. They should have different buttons and so forth on them. And they certainly aren't accurate for use in a World War II context. So you'd need to buy the khaki drill trousers, which are made to this pattern and dye them green. And this can be done. 
it's difficult to get the right shade of green, but it works quite well. And you end up with the pale stitching because they're stitched with khaki polyester thread. You end up with this look of having the paler stitching with the green trousers. As I say, trying to replicate the Indian jungle green color is quite difficult. I've tried and got more of a, a bright uh, grassy green, which I didn't really want. I uh, wanted something more of a gray green like we have here. So trying to get that right is, is difficult. Perhaps using a very uh, weak dye concentration would be good. Unfortunately, you do get the yellowing effect, of course, them being khaki drill originally. It might be possible to strip that dye out of the khaki drill. I don't know. I've not experimented further with that method, but it is a possibility. So some work required there on a either of those options from the reproduction market to get trousers which are something closer to this. Swapping the buttons out is also good to try and get something closer to this uh, particular design of Indian die stamped button which we have here. So that's uh, the trousers, the shirt and the hat, the basic uniform you're looking for. Of course boots would be standard British GS or ammo boots, I'll talk about that more in a, a future part of this series as well and anklets and putties and so forth. Next video, we'll be talking about other options. We'll have a look at the helmet with helmet net, and we'll talk about the different uh, options there are in terms of shirts and so forth. I'll just finish off now by giving you a look at the different sides of the trousers, the different details, the rear pocket and so forth, so you can identify these when you're looking for them. You may be able to find an original pair, maybe not for wearing, but for the collection. So we'll have a look at that now. You can see at the side here, we have a single pocket worked into the side seam there. You have that on each side, the hip pockets there. And on these, quite a nice mishmash, really. You have a, a mismatch, rather. You have a brass version of the Indian buttons there on the back. So it's stamped with the same dies or certainly stamped to the same form, but a brass version on the rear pocket here. So you can see that on the rear uh, of the, uh, the right leg of the trousers, you have this rear pocket sewn on there, again, with a single pleat down the middle. No belt loops or anything, as you can see. And they're nice wide leg trousers as well, all the way down, proper bags as you can see there. So that's the detail of these trousers. Hopefully this video has been useful. As I say, there'll be more parts of this going forward, looking at the basic elements of uniform and equipment used out in the Far East at the time. And that will hopefully give a bit of a guide to those looking to recreate this kit. It is difficult. It's a minefield in terms of trying to find accurate reproductions or modify things so they are more accurate, but it's worth the time and effort it doesn't look right if you don't modify these items. And as I say, we'll have to talk about that with the, the bath dress blouse we'll be talking about in the next video as well, and the bush jacket. So that's what we'll be looking at next, along with the helmet. And I'd say I'm not sure quite when that video will be coming out, but it'll be coming out in the near future. If you'd like to see that and you've enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down below as well. That's everything for this video. So, until next time, bye for now.